just give me the you know. <laughs> conventional wisdom would tell you, okay, when it comes to getting something accomplished, you ask the question, how? How do we get this accomplished? Now, if we're going to talk about what true success is, the wisdom that follows success asks the question, why? How many of you are familiar with Simon Sinek? No? Really? Oh, Google him. I mean, <laughs> he has a book called Start With The Why. And it is a fantastic book. So how and why? And these are the, uh, these are the questions that we're going to kind of walk through a little bit. And Jill, I didn't do this on purpose. I just, you know, there it is. So uh, we're going to talk about Bob and Jill real quick. Um, Bob and Jill both own businesses. Bob and Jill both have people that follow them. And Bob, uh, they had set a goal out in front of his organization, just as Jill did. They set a goal out in front of their organization, and they said, how do we accomplish this goal? And they aligned their business, they aligned their people in order to accomplish how they would reach that goal. Jill, on the other hand, said, why? Now, I know as you're listening to me, you're going, okay, how does that word why connect with the goal out ahead of us? We'll find out in a minute. Now, here's what's interesting. Is studies show us that when you provide, when you start with how, how do we accomplish something? That you're essentially training people to do their jobs better. Uh, there's this little thing, anybody in manufacturing in here, manufacturing? So manufacturing will have this, uh, uh, they'll have a company come in, started in Japan, started with Toyota, a uh, process called Lean Six Sigma. And it is essentially a process that shows you how to be more efficient to get a project done. Uh, cutting corners, uh, wasteful steps, all of those kinds of things. And that really only garners about 10% of our success. On the other hand, when we ask why, 90% success rate. When we ask this question why. Now see, Bob is not happy. Jill was a rock star. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so this, this is the studies. If you read, uh, start with the why from Simon Sinek, he will say this very thing. 90% of the success rate is asking the question why. But you have to define the why. The why must be defined counterintuitively. So how do you define why counterintuitively? It is uh, this definition here. It is a goal that puts your people above success. It is putting a goal out there that puts people above success. So let's go back to Bob and Joe for a minute. Bob said, we have a goal that we need to accomplish. We put it out ahead of ourselves. They aligned their organization. They aligned their people. They brought in a whole bunch of folks, and they said, here's the goal. How do we get there? The struggle that I have with asking that toward a particular goal is there are so many different concepts, so many different philosophies, and theories and practices of how to reach that particular goal. But I am telling you this morning that there is only one. There is just one, and it's this definition right here. So what Jill did is she said, okay, we have a goal out in front of our organization, and conventional wisdom would say, okay, let's focus in on that goal, let's pay attention to that goal, whatever we need to do to make that goal, to hit that goal, is, is all that matters. And what happens then is people become tools. They become expendable in order to reach that goal. But what Jill did was she says, here's our goal. Goals are good, by the way. If, if, if you don't have goals, you, you go nowhere. Uh, it, where there is no vision, people perish. Am I right? Mm -hmm. So you put a goal out in front of you, and what Jill did was said, this is, this is the purpose of our goal. What are, what are we here for? Well, uh, we want to make uh, better widgets. We make widgets. We, we just produce all kinds of widgets, whatever a widget is. <laughs> And then she turned her focus from the goal of widget making, looked into her organization, and said, this is my why, right here. So instead of asking, why does my organization exist, we asked, why do I exist as a leader? What is my purpose? My purpose is to make the people around me better versions of themselves so that we don't even have to worry about how to reach that goal. If I can elevate the humanity within my organization, then I will reduce employee turnover. I'll create enthusiasm. People will be excited. And by the way, they will turn down jobs that pay more than your pay because they would take a bullet from you. Why? Why do I exist? So here's how it gets a little bit deeper. Um, there are three problems that every organization has. I don't care what obstacle what frustration, what barrier, 
your organization faces, every, every organization represented in this room has these three problems, people, process, and profit. Every problem falls under those three categories. Now, this particular graphic is a little askew because it suggests that they are all equal. They are not. Wall Street Journal came out with a report a few years ago. They had done a study of businesses that had started, uh, enjoyed a measure of success, and then ultimately failed. 46% of those businesses failed for a lack of leadership ability. 11% was a lack of experience, and 43% was just everything else. <coughs> so the largest culprit affecting the negative trends of our organizations is a lack of leadership skills. Now, if we go back to this other graph, what we find, according to the Wall Street Journal, is more businesses are investing into the profit and process than anything else. Lean Six Sigma, I mentioned a little bit ago, an organization, a manufacturing organization, can uh, call in somebody who is a quote unquote black belt in Lean Six, and I'm not casting a dark shadow on that, I think that there's a lot of merit in the processes that they teach. But it is a lot of money to have somebody come in and talk with us about the process of how to do our jobs better. And the, pro and the profit, my goodness, financial planning is massive, huge. The consulting industry nationwide in 2017 was something like $365 million. People invested into consulting, most of that was finance. And the next closest one was IT. The least one that people put their investments in is this guy right here. The organizations aren't spending enough time and money in investing into their people, into the leadership skills, bolstering the abilities, making their team better versions of themselves so that they can accomplish the widget making much better. Okay, are you with me so far? When I'm done, we'll have some questions. So if you got questions, just write them down. I'll take some questions. There are two approaches to leadership. There is a personality approach, and there is the counterintuitive approach. We're gonna talk about both of these. If I'm going too fast, raise your hand and just say, slow down, dude. No, all right, all right. <laughs> Somebody asked me uh, if they would, if they're going to fall asleep during my presentation. I said I just get louder when eyes closed. So, uh, okay. So personality leadership. Here's what this looks like. Everybody's personality. You are either an introvert or extrovert. You agree with that? You're one or the other. Whether you were born that way or some event shaped you to be that in your early childhood. But if you are an introvert. There are two temperaments that are associated with introversion. Do you know what they are? There is melancholy. Anybody have ever done any studies on, on personalities? Yeah, okay. So the introvert will have two temperaments. You will be a, uh, a melancholy or you will be phlegmatic. Now flowing from those temperaments are behaviors. Okay, so if you are an introvert uh, phlegmatic, one of, the, one of the, the behaviors is called transactional. So an introverted, phlegmatic individual in a leadership position, by the way, in, there are introverts in leadership positions, right? Uh, transactional leadership. Transactional, the introverted transactional leader would approach a problem more from the perspective of uh, incentive. If you do a better job, then there's this for you. If you, if you make more sales, there's this for you. It's a bribery system. Um, transactional, I'm not, I'm, first of all, don't hear me uh, suggesting that we abolish all incentive programs. That's not what I'm saying. But I will tell you this. I read a study recently, and I actually, if you're on LinkedIn, find me on LinkedIn. I write a lot of articles. I put it on there. put a lot of uh, facts and statistics that I find organization had was really heavy on the incentive program and people were doing a great job new CEO came in not so much said I'm not really interested in the incentive program so this this leader came in with a counterintuitive leader approach to say okay here's our widget goal here's my people why do I exist I exist for you and so he began to develop the team around and productivity went down as you would expect because they were used to Incentive program. 
But as they began to continue with this culture, create this culture, productivity eventually rose higher than it was when the incentive program was in place. True story. Anyway, that's a transactional leader. The second phlegmatic introvert is going to be bureaucratic. In other words, the introverted, phlegmatic, bureaucratic leader is going to address the problem more from the standpoint of what does the rule say? Here's a problem. Here's, you know, we need to address it. What does the policy say? What does the rule say? That's how the bureaucrat will approach that. The other, oops, is laissez-faire. This is the temperament of melancholy. The introverted melancholy, laissez-faire, laissez-faire is French for literally let them be. So, an introverted, melancholy, laissez-faire leader would approach a problem from the perspective of figure it out, let me know what comes out of it. Okay? You with me so far? All right, now let's talk about the extrovert. The extrovert, the first uh, behavior comes from the cleric temperament, and this is an autocratic leader. This is the most dangerous kind of leader there is, the extroverted cleric autocrat. This is the because I said so leader. I'm the leader, I'm the boss, get it done, or you're out of here. That's the autocratic leader. The, 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 and, and the, what I just described is worst case scenario, by the way. There are some autocratic leaders out there that aren't really that rude, you know, but they're out there. So, uh, and then the, then the uh, second temperament is the sanguine. These are the party people. These are the people that know how to sell stuff. These are salespeople. This is the extrovert, sanguine, charismatic leader. Everybody loves this person. Can sell a bridge in a desert. <laughs> Uh, just, you know, that's who they are. Now, I'm going to tell you that I categorize all of this under, the, under a canopy of selfish leadership. Because these behaviors are natural to who we are. If you're not paying attention, if you're not disciplined, you will deal with a problem from whatever one of these behaviors flow from your personality type and temperament. And they don't necessarily elevate humanity. They don't necessarily get into the heart and mind of your people to help create better versions of themselves. They, they approach a problem from whatever is comfortable for me, whatever is natural to me. You with me? Okay, now let's talk about counterintuitive leadership. It's not nearly as complicated. <clears throat> Transformational leadership plus servant leadership always equals success. Transformational leadership and servant leadership. Now, why do I call them counterintuitive? I call transformational and servant leadership counterintuitive because they are not net. The competencies that we're about to go through that define those two leadership styles are not natural to human nature. How do I know that? Well, it starts with the beginning of life. Remember this? Remember when you were pregnant? Guys, we were pregnant too. Are you married? I am not. All right, I'm not going to ask you have kids then. Um, I have three kids. My oldest is 27. My daughter, who attends here, is 23. And my youngest will be 20 here shortly. I remember these days. I remember the great expectation. I remember painting the room, getting the room ready having the, the baby showers and just in great expectation for the blessing of life that would come in and make our world better, and we got that. <laughs> now, I don't know who this little girl is, and I don't know what her problem is, but I know this about humanity. We come into this world broken creatures. You don't have to teach a child to tell a lie. You don't have to teach a child to throw a fit when they don't get what they want. It is a part of our natural human nature. We enter this world already selfish individuals. The problem with that is this little girl, if she's not careful and she's not disciplined, then she will grow up and become your boss with that same temperament. That happens. Have you worked with a boss 
that just had to have it her way, his way? Have you worked with a boss that was so melancholy laissez-faire that it seemed like they didn't even care that you were struggling? Have you worked with all of those temperaments? They're out there. It is incumbent upon us to discipline ourselves to learn the competencies that help us to become counterintuitive to what is natural to ourselves so that we can influence people better. Remember this. People don't leave jobs. You gonna finish that for me? They leave leaders. People leave leaders. So we have to become better versions of our own self, our own management, our own leadership, and this is how I'm gonna talk about it. I love to talk about these competencies from a structural point of view. So in the next few minutes, we're gonna build a house. I love houses, I love buildings. Um, I used to have, as a part of this presentation, two pictures. I took them out for some reason, not sure why. One picture was a house that was uh, crumbly. Like, well, not crumbly, but the foundation was gone. Um, and then the next house was a fairly new constructed home. And I always would ask people, tell me what you see in the first picture. And, and they would describe the house that's, that's kind of off its foundation. Interestingly enough, that you know, the windows were broken. There was a ladder hanging on the side of the house that was still there. Uh, nothing was out of place except for the fact that the foundation was gone on one end and it was still rendering the house essentially useless. But for all intents and purposes, still appeared functional. That kind of describes some businesses. That for all intents and purposes, it appears functional, but there's a foundation somewhere under there broken. And then when I show the new constructed home, I would say, tell me everything you see about that home. And no one ever mentions the foundation. It's not seen, but it's doing its job. So as leaders, our job is the foundation of that structure. And when you're doing your job well, guess who gets the credit? Not you. Everybody around you. So we're going we're to put a foundation up here. And the first thing we do is we dig a hole we, and we throw a, a pillar in the ground. And this pillar is called empathy. And by the way, this is not here randomly. This is the first step to positively influencing anybody. It's empathy. If you don't begin here, you cannot go anywhere. Empathy. Empathy is not sympathy. Sympathy finds someone down in a hole, sits down at the top of that hole, and says, your situation is terrible. I feel horrible for you. If there's anything I can do, let me know I'm here for you. That's sympathy. Empathy is helping the person down in the hole uh, understand that you've been in that hole, maybe get down in that hole with them and provide for them a pathway that you once found to get out of that hole. So in some of your jobs, you have people that you're working with that are really struggling right now. And I, I would be willing to bet if I were a betting man. I'm typically a loser when it comes to gambling, so I just don't do it. But if I were a betting man, I would be willing to bet that each and every one of you, prior to having the positions that you currently have, were somewhere out in the work field. And there's a blood trail of that position to the office that you now hold. You've got the scars, the bumps, and the bruises to show your journey from where you started to where you are now. Somebody, somewhere, in your sphere of influence needs to hear that story. They need to know that you get their pain. And when a leader can provide the knowledge, not just, not just a, a veneer, superficial uh, word of wisdom, but to really get down into this person's business and let them understand that you get their pain. There's nothing more powerful than your own story. Nothing more powerful. Empathy moves people from a point of incompetence and failure and struggle uh, to victory and success. Empathy is the first step. Now, here's what happens. When we provide that empathy, we've accomplished this, they can, they, can, they can really know that we get them. Now we move along to what I call assuring leadership. Assurance. A synonym to assurance could likely be inspiration. Uh, inspiring people. We want to inspire people, but I want to just tell you that uh, inspiration is a very... It's a very tricky thing, and if you don't do it right, it'll fail. Meaning this, once you have provided the empathy, once your, your, uh, your worker, your follower, your volunteer, whoever that is, 
um, has uh, really understood that you care, and now they're ready to follow, if you were to fall into conventional wisdom of inspiration, here's what you would do. You would say, now listen, you can come out of this. Tomorrow's a better day. The sun will come up tomorrow. Things will be better. Everything can just tomorrow. That's, that's inspiration, and that doesn't work. There's this thing that came across the internet quite some time ago that said there's a reason why the windshield is so big and the rear view mirror is so small. And in this particular context, I disagree with that. Because nothing moves someone more from a, from a time of slump than to remind them of how valuable they once were. So when you've got somebody who's really struggling, they're hurting, and we take this approach of cheerleading and, and just, you know, add a boy, go get him, you're, you know, you, tomorrow's a better day. That falls flat almost every time. But in that moment, when you can bring that person up close and say, let me show you the value that you brought to this organization. Let's take a look at your resume, the very reason that got you in the door in the first place. Let me just remind you of how valuable you were, how valuable you are. You're in a tough spot right now, but that doesn't change the accomplishments that you bring to the table. Do you know why that is so important? Because when somebody falls in a slump, and we all get there, when somebody falls into a slump, the first person that they begin to doubt is themselves. The second person they begin to doubt is the boss's confidence in them, your confidence in them. They're coming to work every day in this time of slump, wondering if the pink slip is going to be on their desk. Am I going to be fired? The autocratic leader might just as a knee-jerk reaction say, you're slipping, you're out of here, we need somebody more productive. Now, you and I know, any HR people in here? Yeah. Um, replacing someone is very expensive, isn't it? Yes. Uh, 2018, or no, was it 2017? 2018, <coughs> uh, if, if, the st if the stats I have are right, saw an employee turnover rate of like 27% two years ago. 27%. I'm not very good at math, but it, I think the average the average salary across the United States was probably in the neighborhood of forty thousand dollars, and it takes about twenty percent of that person's salary to replace that person through non-productive hours, um, Indeed advertisement, whatever the case may be. Now, if you take twenty-seven percent and and multiply that by you know, if somebody has a hundred employees and they lost 27 of them and each of them had a salary of $40,000 and it takes 20% of their salary, you, you do the math on that. That's a chunk of change. This process changes that number drastically. When we can change the approach of you're in a slump, we need to replace you, it's gone for too long. Because the counterintuitive leader will catch this early on and get down into that person's business and begin to pull them out so the slump doesn't last very long at all. But those that would take a hands-off approach or an iron-fisted approach or a bureaucratic or transactional or even a charismatic approach, that's the cheerleader. Hey, man, come on, do it. Doesn't really move things. This is the process right here. Empathy and assurance. The factual, I call it factual inspiration. Reminding them of the value that they brought. Now, the final pillar we're going to throw in this ground, I call it spiritual leadership. This freaks people out for some reason. I have had clients kind of get look an overview of my of my of my uh, what I teach, and they're like, uh, "Yeah, I don't want you coming in here and trying to convert me to some crazy religion or anything like that. That's not what the, that's not what this is. Um, I, I don't have enough room to put um, emotional intelligence in there." <laughs> Spiritual information can be defined by emotional intelligence, accountability, responsibility, and integrity. The reason why these are so important is because these competencies here, and everything that we're going to see above this, are different from this one. This one is unique in so much as it is how you discipline yourself internally. This is how you discipline yourself externally. It's how you treat other people. But if you don't have this first, none of this other stuff will matter. If you can't keep yourself calm in an already tense situation, if you don't know what your own trigger points are, if you don't recognize the fact that you are a leader and you don't get the privilege of coming into work and having a bad day, 
how that smack you right now. You don't get the privilege of coming into work and having a bad day. Because people are depending upon you. I'm going to be doing the same presentation for um, a case management organization soon. And I checked with her. And I probably should have checked with you first. But I'm, I'm, you know, you'll, you'll never invite me back if you hate what I'm about to say. Um, <laughs> one of the greatest examples of, of what I'm talking about here can be found in the book of Philippians in the Bible. When Paul, who wrote that, wrote to the people, his, his readers, he said things like, whatever is lovely, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is praiseworthy, think on these things. And if you don't know the historical content of this, then you don't know that he wrote that from prison. Now, that is a leader who recognized that there are people that need him to be inspirational rather than woe is me in that moment. So as leaders, when we walk into our places of employment, when we walk into the position that you, by the way, chose, you chose to be a leader, then you don't get to have a bad day. You have to check that at the door. And then you need to come in and you need to be for your people what they need you to be for them. That is powerful. And by the way, somebody one of these days would be like, you know, her life was falling apart and she came in and inspired me. Wow, what trust. So we call this servant leadership. This is the foundation. If you can master this, you can go anywhere. Once you get this foundation laid, the sky is the limit for you. We're going to continue to build this house. The first wall we're going to put up in this house is called decisive leadership. Developing your ability to be decisive. Now, some people really struggle with this. And one of the things that I, that I try to develop in my clients is, uh, is risk management. I mean, we don't want to just go out there and just start shooting from the hip on decisions. But I try to help people develop the ability to, to make decisions in those moments when you don't have the opportunity to spend a whole lot of time doing research. To make that decision and be able to go to bed at night and sleep well. But when we talk about decisive leadership, it's, it's a double-edged sword. And the first edge of the sword I'm going to talk to you about is what I call PDT. PDT, Personal Data Threshold. Every one of us in here have a personal data threshold. And what that means is simply this. You only know what you know and you don't know anything more. Is that, is, is that clear? Do you understand that? You only know what you know, you don't know anything more. One time I walked into the bank and I was late because I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty structured on my time. And I was late this day because I was finishing up a paper on my PhD. And she says, oh, you're late today. And I said, yeah. I said, I was finishing up some stuff in the office and writing a paper. So what are you writing about? I said, well, I'm actually finishing a PhD. She goes, oh, you must be smart. <laughs> and I said, I'm only studying leadership. I don't know math. <laughs> I only know what I know, and I don't know anything more. That's it. That's my PDT. Your PDT is the culmination of everything that you have learned and everything that you experienced, even up to this very second now. <coughs> encompasses your PDT, your personal data threshold. Here's the problem with every one of our PDTs. Tomorrow, we will all be faced with a decision that our PDT cannot inform. There will be a decision that will present itself that you're going to look into the, the database of your own PDT and you're going to say, I don't have the information to make this decision. I don't have the knowledge to move forward on this decision. Which brings me to the other edge of this sword, and that is what I call my rush philosophy. And I do mean the band Rush. They had a brilliant lyric in one of their songs. And the lyric was this, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. The question then becomes, what then did you choose? If you were faced with a decision your PDT cannot inform, and you did not make a decision, you would likely say, well, Mike, we have chosen to avert disaster because I didn't have the information to make that decision. And I would say, au contraire, you have avoided success. And you would respond with, how? And I would tell you this story. There was a man who was once elected CEO of an organization. This is a true story, by the way. Uh, he was elected CEO of an organization the organization was in peril, and he took the helm of this organization. And with the, uh, with the meetings of his executive board, they began to make decisions, and he helped them guide themselves through decisions, and it seemed everything that they did turned to gold. He had the Midas touch. 
The company came out of their decline, went into growth, and everybody was receiving bonuses, and it was a good time. And one of his colleagues came up to him one day and said, what is it about you, man? Everything you do seems to work. And he responded with this, the, the, the trick is to make right decisions. And his, his friend said, I get that, but how do you know what the right decisions are? And he responded, because I've spent years making the wrong ones. You see, we can look at our own PDT and we can say, I don't have what it takes to inform that decision, and then choose to not make a decision and just you know, not have a disaster. Because you could make that decision and it could make your organization millions of dollars or it could cost it thousands, if not millions. But when I go back to saying, if you choose to uh, make the decision or if you've chosen not to make the decision, then you have chosen against success, it is because once you make that decision and it was the wrong decision, your PDT is now expanded. Now you have learned a valuable lesson. And is that not what life is about? It's learning lessons. Now, I would talk to you deeper at some other point about uh, calculated decisions and risk management and things of that nature, but I would just challenge you that there are going to be decisions in your life that we have to just take that risk. There is no reward outside of risk. But that is how we learn to be better, decisive people, is through the trial and error of our past. Okay? How's that? Creativity. I love this one. And every time I do this presentation, I can't wait until that wall throws itself up in there. A study came out in 2016 that said in 2020, there will be three things that every leader will need to possess. Critical thinking, problem solving, and creativity. Now, I cannot teach you creativity. Um, I can tell you this, that creativity, the best way to become more creative is to be a thief of ideas. That's what I tell people. Be, be a thief of ideas. Um, take it, borrow it, tweak it, make it your own. There are, there's lots of things for our humanity to discover, but there are few thoughts that have not been unearthed. Here's the interesting thing about creativity. Studies show that people who are more creative are introverted. Introverted people possess the highest level of creativity. They're more contemplative. And by the way, did I tell you that I'm the extroverted cleric autocrat? I'm one of the most dangerous leaders. I'm the most dangerous. <laughs> um, I've learned to curb that. I've learned to be more counterintuitive. The extroverted autocratic leaders, one of the things that they struggle with the most is other people's ideas. Who, take a guess on who dominates the leadership positions the most, the introvert or the extrovert? Extrovert. There are more, there are more extroverts in leadership than there are introverts, but there are more creative people in introverts than there are extroverts. What does that say? We're too busy it, it, yeah. <laughs> it, it says that we have to really take counterintuitive leadership very, very seriously. That if, if, if the upper echelon of our organizations must possess creativity and the extroverts aren't very creative, then we need to start opening up the doors for, for inclusion. What do you think? What are your ideas? And by the way, one of the, one of the problems most autocratic leaders have, even charismatic leaders, is that we like to empower people, and that's coming up next, by the way. We like to empower people but then we have, this, we have this temptation to go back when they're done and make it the way we wanted it in the first place. And that is a horrible way to go. If you want to kill trust in a hurry, do that. Let them do it the way they would do it, even if it's not the way you would do it. So creativity, uh, it's, it's a very important competency of leadership, but most leaders don't have it. It, it, must, be, it must be included. They are. Like you said, you're still you're kind of stealing other ideas. Like yeah. You've noticed more things. Yeah. Whereas the, I know many autocratic yeah. and charismatic folks, and they tend to not see other. Yeah, we're, you know, she just said she likes the energy in here. It's because I'm an extroverted cleric autocrat. Everything in me right now is going a thousand miles an hour. 
So, and I'm missing a lot of things that I would really love to say because I'm not very contemplative. I have to slow down. And when I leave here, I'm going to go somewhere. I'm probably going to hit Chipotle and just like <laughs> chill for a minute because I got to go see some clients so I can just let my brain reboot. Because uh, if I'm not careful, I'll just keep going. That's just how we function. I mean, I thrive off of this stuff, but if I'm not careful, I mean, you know, computers can only go so long before you've got to debug that thing. And, you're, and by the way, um, I, I wrote an article on LinkedIn, and it's called The Need to Succeed in Neurological Disorders. The Need to Succeed and Neurological Disorders. And it essentially shows some statistics that uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, all of these diseases are, are coming to a heightened level because of the inundation of useless information. We've got to curb that. Teen suicide has, now they haven't made this absolute connection, but they, they've looked at the dates when they have seen depression in teenagers and teen suicide climb at the inauguration of smartphones. That went up as well. So there's got to be a connection in there somewhere. You know, the one things that I, the, one of the things that I even tell my extroverted leaders is if you really want to work on your creativity, then you need to spend some time alone. You need to just unplug, meditate, go to a, go golf, go to church, whatever you need to do to just chill because your brain needs that. Okay, creativity. I told you empowering was coming, so there it is. Empowering is the, the, the best thing that you can do for people. And now, by the way, the introverted, uh, melancholy, laissez-faire leaders are generally tagged as being the best empowering leaders there are, but they're not. Because they're not so much empowering people because they want them to do better, they're sort of empowering them because they don't want to get involved in the chaos of it. Figure it out. Let me know. A true empowering leader doesn't just give responsibilities. A true empowering leader creates leaders out of people through the training and development that they provide on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I'll give you a real quick example. Uh, I'm a football fan. Any football fans in here? Yeah. The guys. You, there's no female football fans? All right. Okay. Um, so... If you were to Google right now uh, Bill Walsh and his coaching tree, Bill Walsh is a retired NFL coach. Uh, he had his heyday with the San Francisco 49ers, and uh, his coaching tree, his flow chart of leadership is massive, just big. Like all these coaches that worked for him and then went out and coached other teams, and they went out and coached other teams, and so on so forth. And then if you were to do the same thing for a guy named Bill Parcells, Bill Parcells' coaching tree, he is a retired NFL coach as well, but his coaching tree is more of a coaching uh, bush. It's a lot smaller. Not, not too many people came out under, under his leadership, but here's the difference. Under Bill Parcell's coaching bush, there are Super Bowl championships, college championships, ring after ring after ring of the coaches that he taught. Not so much under Bill Walsh. So, I was talking with a client once, well, he ended up not being a client because he didn't like what I had to say. And uh, I guess I didn't care. I would rather lose you as a friend than see your job crumble because I didn't give you the proper advice. We were talking about this very issue here. And I talked about the importance of elevating the people around you, empowering them to become the kind of leaders that they might even leave your job and create competition for you. And his response was, I would never allow that to happen. I am not going, I do not want my people to rise up and go out and create my competition. It was at that point that I said, I cannot help you. I didn't say it out loud, I just said it in my breath. I cannot help you. Here's what is so important about that. If you were to do something like that in your organization and you were to lose volunteers or lose people in your employment, and you continue to do this, somebody somewhere is going to pay attention to all these new leaders popping up all over town. And they're going to say, where did he come from? Oh, he came up from under her leadership. Well, where did she come from? Oh, she came up from her leadership. And so on and so forth. And now all of a sudden, nobody wants to work for them. They want to work for you. Because you are a people developer. You crank out leaders like none other. 
Now you've got to pick a litter of all the people that you want to hire because they know this is a company that cares about people. That's what empowering does. And last wall that I'm going to throw in here under transformational leadership is visionary. And I want to just, I want to tell you this. I wish I had some examples of uh, the assessment that I provide. But the one thing that I tell people is this right here is so vitally important that even though this is the starting point, and I have seen clients that I've worked with start off and they just, they're rock stars with servant leadership. They're not very good with transformational leadership, but if, here, if you start here, this takes off almost instantaneously. The other way around is a little bit harder. I've had people that are really good up here, but not very good up here. It's a little bit harder to get this up because they're so good at that. This is where it starts, but I will tell you this. This right here is the heartbeat of all of this. If you are good at every one of these, but you don't develop this, at some point, everything else will begin to fail. That is how important vision is. Vision is this. Not only does your organization need to have a vision statement, a mission statement. Mine is, uh, the, you're probably wondering, where in the world did you get the name of your business, Executive Spectrum? It's a compound word. It comes from my mission statement. Developing successful executives by improving leadership perspectives. Everything starts with a worldview. You gotta change how you see people and how you see things in order to be successful. That's what I do. Vision is not only having a vision for your organization, but it's having a vision for yourself. What are your personal goals? What are your professional goals? But it goes even a step further. And it is having the ability, and this is where creativity comes in. It's having the ability to impart vision into the people who work for you, to make them believe not only in themselves, but in the job that they're actually executing. 1995, I'm 25 years old. I'm working in Northeast Ohio at a company called Molded Fiberglass. I operated, I was the press operator and crew leader of the largest press in the state of Ohio at that time. My job was to pump out 98 sleeper caps for Freightliner every single day. We did the left panel, the right panel, and the center panel. Um, and, and, and not all at the same day, but every day you come in, these, these dyes, if you know anything about this, are 300 plus degrees, so it's super hot in there. And this is a place that had lots of presses. So you have this big, huge press that might be about three quarters the size of this, the width of this room, and a crew of about 10 of us. And you, you have this fiberglass shell, and you pour this mix, and you put this, this fiberglass veil on it. You pick it up, you put it in the press, and it closes down, cures it, they pop it out, and there's a, there's a sleeper side. The engineers of our organization came up with this process called in-mold coating. And it was pretty cool. Uh, three quarters of the way through the curing process, the press would open up, and there'd be a pump that would pump this black rubberized coating onto the part. It would close, cover the whole part. What it did is it saved Freightliner millions of dollars a year in painting. They didn't have to prime anymore. They could just go right to paint. And it made the parts glorious. The paint just glowed. Now, throughout, once we mastered this process, because my press was sort of the guinea pig of the whole process, they had taken me off of the press and put me in HR. We developed a curriculum to train all three plants, all three ships. That was my first public speaking experience. I'm standing behind sleeper cabs, hiding, not knowing how to conduct myself. But we trained all of these ships and all of these plants, and then one day they decided that they would take a small crew of us and fly us to uh, North or South Carolina. I can't remember which of the Carolinas that the Freightliner plant is in. So there I am in Freightliner looking at these larger-than-life trucks being dragged through this factory, all kinds of colors. And they took us to the place where our parts that we created in Northeast Ohio got shipped into receiving. And I, I wanted to find my employee number. So I'm looking at these parts, and I find one, and I pull it aside, and there is my number. Something changed in my heart that day. I no longer saw my job as a mundane, humdrum, pumping out 98 characterless, blank, smelly parts every day. I now saw myself as a part of the larger transportation system that moves this world around. I, I wish that I could say that everybody felt that. I don't know, I didn't ask them, I did. And I went back to that job in Northeast Ohio 
with a new perspective on my role. I was excited about my job. I saw it differently. Now, a Freightliner or a multi fiberglass probably didn't have the funds to fly everybody to the Carolinas to see this happen. But the challenge then lies upon us as individuals and in tapping into the creativity to say, how can we change the view of our people? How can, we, how can we factually inspire them? How can we put that vision into their heart and mind that lets them believe that they're not just creating something? They're not just making a widget. There's something beyond that that is greater than the production itself. That is so incredibly powerful. That is what changes people.